I'm Brian Lenskis from the Low Carb MD Podcast, and I have a hero here. I'm gonna start getting nervous. Dr. Mark Kukazella. We had him on the podcast, and he's an amazing guy, and tell people your story, like how you kind of got into this realm and uh, your life and all that fun stuff. Uh, well, <laughs> I'll try to give this short story about, you know, you guys, you and Tro with your show, you guys are my heroes too. You know, just sharing the word, and you, you mentioned almost 100 shows now, Brian? Yeah. 100 yeah, shows. That's a, that's a lot of work just for the love of this, and you're, I mean, you're changing lives. You know, people come up to me and say, gosh, I listened to the show on Low Carb MD, and, uh, you know, learned something or, you know, challenged me to go back to my institution and try to do some change. So what you're doing in your show, unless we can get, get it out, what these little pods of people are doing you know, around the world, uh, then the movement grows, so. Exactly, I think we all do our part. And yeah. you know, we're in awe, uh, you know, we'll, we'll tell, you could tell your story how you got into this, and I want to tell about your accomplishments that you're having, because we get to brag on each other, this is fun, I got a nice guy here who's being cool. And yeah, we had fun yeah. last night. Yeah, we got to hang out, we practice for this. We had some, some uh, good meat, we had some seafood, some good salad. Maybe a glass of dry, dry bread. Some, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was, was good. nice. No, it was yeah. fun uh, just, uh, meeting all the speakers last night. Um, yeah, so um, my background, I'm a professor at uh, WVU, West Virginia University School of Medicine. Been there for about 15 years, just retired from 29 years of military service also. Started my career active duty military, family doc, flight medicine, and then uh, got out of active duty and became reserves and worked right uh, across the block here at University of Colorado for about five years after separating from the Air Force Academy, which was down the road. Um, so this fun place to be back in Denver. Just went for a lunchtime jog on one of my favorite routes right through the city That's on Spear Boulevard. There's a nice little little bike trail. But I, I got into, I always you know, believed as we all did, I was like a fitness guy and a lot of my work with the military was the fitness test. I was a runner, competed for the Air Force. I've been a runner through my whole life and uh, was brought on board in about 2012 to create a program for the Air Force to help people pass the fitness test. A uh, new chief of staff had come on board and he, he tightened the screws, so to speak, on the test. I mean, he made it more difficult. And uh, it used to be a step test and a bike test. And, he, and it used to be a run test further before that, but people were having cardiac events on the run and they figured probably not a good idea to, to kill people in a fitness yeah. test. But the new chief of staff came on board and said, look, this is just a test to be able to go down range. You know, if you can't run, you know, you're probably not fit for duty. And uh, failure rates went up and they wanted to know that we had no instruction on how to train people to run. I mean, just like in school, we had no nutritional education too. So they gave me six months for this project, which was, which was nice. You know, I mean, most of us read a paper or two a week if we're lucky, but I had six months to dig into the root causes of why people were failing the test. And I quickly saw that BMI and obesity, you know, that curve and the failure rate were kind of the same line, yeah, yeah, yeah. the same line, yeah. Like, well, I don't know Jack about nutrition. You know, I thought I did, but it's all, the internet was kind of coming on then too. And uh, you know, you just start randomly going down rabbit holes. And I came across this article uh, by Gary Taubes. I never heard of the dude. Um, it was maybe it's all been a big flat, fat lie. And yeah. I just pulled up this article. It was New York Times Magazine. I was like, that makes a lot of sense. I'm working in West Virginia at the time, you know, where pretty much every patient I saw was obese. And every yeah, patient sure. I saw, I told you need to like burn 500 more calories than you eat a day, and then multiply that by seven, and yeah, then yeah, you yeah. lose a pound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It calories in, calories out. Logical you just do sense. It. Yeah, exactly. Right, makes sense. Made sense. I didn't think I was harming people with that advice, but you know, so that article uh, got me thinking. But his book had come out a couple years earlier too, "Good Calories, Bad Calories." I'd never heard of that book either, so I picked up the book, which was a 450-page tome with like a thousand references. Yeah, it's and massive. I was like, Whoa! <laughs> yeah, it's like this is bad. And I read it again. And, um, I read why we got fat. Why yeah, we get that's fat? The what you do about it? I'm like, that's version. a little. I'll, I'll take that yeah, one. I'll work up that. to the other stuff. Yeah. yeah I mean, so there wasn't more all these keto or low carb books at the time. I mean, the keto or low carb word wasn't even around. It was good calories, bad calories. Was this disruptive book? But I was on the road for about six months, also going to different bases uh, to try to, you know, help uh, classes. You know, we do workshops. We do. You know, take people out and teach them running mechanics and, you know, and just kind of listen to them about what their barriers and issues were. So I would go in after reading that book, I had the, I mean, obesity was an issue. So I would just ask this question, Brian, and say, you know, has, have any of you lost 50 pounds and kept it off for a year or for six months? I mean, just come up with something like that. Uh, and maybe one hand go up. This would be like a base gym, 100 people, maybe two hands go up. 
And the, the answer always was something like this. Well, I, you know, I got rid of sugar. Mm-hmm. You know, I got rid of bread. Uh, you know, I got rid of all the sweet drinks. <laughs> did Afghans. You know, they could yeah, never yeah, say yeah, the word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They whisper it to you. Because you know, they I'm a doc, right? Yeah, yeah. They're like, oh, you're going to be mad. They, they, palio, the word palio was out then. But it wasn't like palio wrapper junk food. It was palio in 2012 was like eat meat, cheat, you know, something you'd yeah. kill or gather. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, yeah. so it was all some version of low carb. And uh, so, yeah, this makes sense. And at the same time, you know, I had to get all my labs too. So I'm a flight doc and my uh, fasting sugar was 140 and I did A1C, it was like in the low sixes. And I looked like this, was a runner. And uh, that didn't, you know, to the docs, that didn't make a lot of sense because, you know, I didn't fit that paradigm. And I was at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which is their kind of main medical center and they had a, endocrine research area and they gave me one of these little CGM things you know, I'd never heard of that either I mean like as a family doc in 2012 a CGM would be like maybe a few type ones and special yeah exactly right you no know, academic yeah. institutions never touched by a family doc but they had one I could check out for a few days and I saw immediately whoa like I have I was eating you know troughs of cereal like like six times a day yeah, because you could you weren't gaining could. weight so you're just and running that, you're yeah, just carb running, running it off like, like professor Noakes used to say in the yeah, old days and right? that's what we thought I mean it wasn't a fun way to roll but that's what we thought was the deal and I was probably needing to eat because my you know blood glucose spikes and it starts dropping it's just driving it but I saw like immediately like half of a serving of what I would usually have would jack my sugar up to like 250 and they did this test called a C-peptide which is a measure of your endogenous insulin production mine was about 0.3 so it put me on the spectrum of an insulin insufficient person yeah, different than an insulin resistant person yeah. but the, the the treatment's the same. I mean, the exactly sugar's right. the poison yes, exactly to, to both right. groups. And we were talking about that with the Asian communities where people don't have a lot of muscle mass and you know, they're not having a lot of fat tissue. Some people just don't make a ton of insulin. Yeah, the pancreas just... But nonetheless, fits. the treatment's the same. The treatment's the same. Yeah. If eating sugar makes your sugar go high or makes you more obese, then don't eat the, the carbs. Yeah. And that was the start of, of my own personal low-carb experiment and my teaching. So I came off of that uh, assignment and went back to my hospital and at the and I knew immediately from my, I'd start checking my sugar three to four times a day because it's in the military if, if you have an A1C greater than 6.5 or if you're on meds you're medically boarded so you know you have skin in the game if you want to yeah, keep yeah, it yeah. so if you can keep yeah. it under the yeah, the pilots can't lie if you're on insulin and all that kind of yeah, stuff. You're always it's, trying it's a big to, deal. To hack it in some yeah, way, exactly, right? You're yeah. Trying to cheat the test to keep your wings, you know. So, you know, checking your sugar three or four times a day, you know, you see pretty close to what a CGM would do, but you, you know the things that rise it up. But I knew at that time ten grams of carbs would raise a diabetic, you know, forty points, right? This just was I could do it myself, you know, take yes. one banana I'd go up you know, 70, 80 points or something. Well, I think the more. CGM are, is really a continuous glucose monitor is changing medicine because we're seeing it. Now you see it. It's not yeah, theoretical anymore. One. You can see what it is, right? I'm on right now. Yeah, yeah he showed see. us how to put them on, actually. Yeah, 30 seconds. Yeah, yesterday this talk yeah, was you great. Check your phone, bing, and you see. Yeah, what and you know where you're at all the time, and you can see, oh, you eat certain yeah. foods or I get stressed, what happens? And, and it's pretty remarkable. We learn a t- great yeah, deal could, of that. We could see even just to, I mean, to show the people on the camera how this works. So I had one of those little low carb bars and a handful of nuts. That's pretty good, 108. Yeah, so the, my curve today is all in the range, all um, less than 150. I haven't, th- that was my first real food today. Oh, I had a chunk of cheese too, right after my run. But so first food today was kind of right about there. And so right it's, after you run it, it, yeah, it spikes up for a little while and then comes back down? Yeah, the down. run makes it spike up. So when the, when you run, you actually increase your glucose with without eating. And that's an interesting, uh, just an interesting yeah, aside on that, that is that a lot yeah. of runners and athletes, triathletes, will have high sugar levels, and it may be, you know, part of yeah, it's what just, you're eating. It's just but short part term. it's physiological that your body allows you to have more sugar in the system because you need it because your body's burning. Yeah, your body it. starts making it. So I'm showing Brian my curve here. So I went out and ran at 12, ran from about 12 to one, so the sugar goes up while while you're running. And that's a good thing. That's a body. Yeah, doing it's the natural. Right your body's doing it. Yeah, it wants to make sure you have energy because yeah. glucagon is supposed to make sure we don't get low sugar. So the yeah, physiology. We had to talk science with this guy. Yeah, yeah. He's a smart dog. But, uh, yeah, so I brought it back, and, and this is, you know, it's a slow road. So I brought this uh, idea back to my hospital and that we should have real low carb meals for diabetes patients. And at that time, if you go in, and sadly today, you know, even though Brian, all the speakers have talked about, so the low carb option is in all the ADA guidelines. But this is not like rogue. You know, this is, you know, if you go into a hospital or into a clinic, 
you know, if you follow the current guidelines, we should say here's a Mediterranean pattern, here's a traditional pattern, and here's a low carb pattern. Here's the risk and benefit of them all. You know, in, in my opinion, what's the downside of a low carb diet? You know, there's no downside of eating eggs, meat, cheese, and butter, and not taking as much medication and all the nice salads. You know, that's it's and lowering your medication. There's no real risk in that. There's yeah. risk in more carbs and more drugs because we know every month there's another side effect reported on a drug, hypoglycemia. So you know, so high carbohydrate meals, high doses of insulin lead to wide fluctuations in glucose. You notice my curve there shows low carbohydrate meals, you know, lower amounts of insulin, low fluctuations. Well, plus we have medicines now that we give you to make your sugars go down, so it makes you pee out the extra sugar. Guess what? You can get yeah, serious infections and die, and you know, have all kinds of stuff. And, yeah, so it's a big, it's a money big deal. Too. So you can yeah. put it in this end rather than making it come out the other end. You know, that seems like it's more logical because it's logical. the other thing, which is really what it's important that you've accomplished, and I want you to tell people about that, but. What us docs get frustrated, especially as low carb docs, is our patient goes into the hospital, they're not on, on insulin, they leave on insulin because they give you a bunch of sugar because they think it's healthy, <laughs> yeah. orange juice and toast and all that stuff. And then they leave on insulin, they give them a sliding scale because that's just what we've done for the last 50 years or something. And so it's frustrating, they go in and then they get insulin resistant, they get these problems, they come out on insulin, they, it, that's, they just said, that's what they put me on. So what are you accomplishing in your hospital, which is, which is, a, which is a, something that no one else has ever done before? Yeah, it's education, uh, you know, it's education of everybody, the pharmacist, the dietitian, the staff. But you got the them residents. to get soda out, right? Yeah, we got soda out, that was the second that step. That is of, a huge the, deal. That's, yeah, and, and now other hospitals are wanting to do that, and that should be a no-brainer for a healthcare institution, as you know, Robert Lustig showed yesterday. I mean, sugar, high fructose corn syrup in a drink is a toxin. I mean, and that's even in a well person. You take exactly. a sick person who are in the hospitals, it is a toxin. Infections, um, immune response, I mean, you name the why they're in the hospital. Not a single condition that they have entered the hospital for will be improved by drinking sugar-sweetened drinks. Well, and that was his biggest finding, right? When he when he was looking, he, he had all these yeah, obese right. kids and he was trying to figure out why are these kids obese? So is it the Chinese foods, the Mexican foods? The, but they found their, their biggest correlation was sugary drinks, yes. right? And all these kids think they need it for energy and they're, it's turning into a total disaster and losing your energy, right? By, oh by yeah, it. like if I drank a Gatorade before running today, I would not have felt good. I couldn't have made the, sh the energy because it would have insulin go up a little bit so you block fat adaptation. So yeah, just it sabotages your exercise efforts. But we started 10 gram carb per meal in my hospital. Instead, a standard hospital menu, even if you type in you know, ADA diet or you have an electronic medical record, which you're all doing, they just click a button, ADA diet, and that is minimum 60 grams of carbs per meal. Mm -hmm. And 10 gram of carbs raises your sugar 40, 60 grams <laughs> raises your sugar. So there's always a matching yeah, insulin dose. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. It's madness. So, so you're treating, basically what you're doing is madness. You're, you're, you're eating to treat the drug that you're taking, basically, yeah, right? Because yeah. if you don't and eat that stuff, it. yeah, it's just incredible. They're chasing it all they the time want, and they never catch up. They never catch up. So you want to have smooth, it's like a plane, right? You don't want to be flying like this. And that, that, that started the initiative of education and nurses becoming educated, and then nursing's losing weight, right? They're all stressed, night shift. Yeah, and, yeah. And they made the, the policy change. Poor sleep, poor, poor sleep, sleep, stress, stress tense, and then, you know, someone brings you donuts station, at two in the morning, and they just, yeah, it's just incredible. Goodies. Yeah, it, it's incredible what health consequences we're going in. Yeah, we know if in residency, you you don't know when you're going to eat again, so you eat a big, huge meal, and then it's like two hours later, oh, we have time yeah, to eat, let's do it again, because you never know. The muffins from yeah, Panera, it's just, it's oh, you go to the doctors, you, you wonder why doctors die 10 years before everyone else. They do, that, that's true. That's because a it's a, you know, you see it's, it's all bagels and cookies, and you know, the doctor's lounge is a total disaster, it's a, it's right? A light so has that been able field. to change also in, in so, the hospital? Yeah, we, have a, we do have a little doctor's lounge, and they, they don't have real junk food in there, so, so in our doctor's lounge, yes, yeah, sugar drinks are out everywhere, so it's out of the vending machines, out of the cafeteria, off the patient trays. You know, I mean, you could, if you really want one and you work there, you could walk three blocks down and there's a 7-Eleven. So you could burn it off and burn out, and yeah, you wouldn't, you even, you wouldn't even burn on the whole thing when you, if you did no, that, right? No, but they've got to go out of their way, just like tobacco used to be on medical campuses when we started sure. residency. Yeah, now yeah. people think, God, oh, do you believe they used to 
smoke in hospitals? So I would, yeah. I would hope, this is my dream. And it was always the respiratory therapists who were out there smoking. Out there they smoking. worked like people on the ventilator and they're out smoking. It was like on their breaks, like really? That, yeah, so it's amazing. So in 10 years, you know, if we get back on the show, we would both be saying something like this. Do you believe we used to serve sugars in hospitals? I think so, I think, I think and you were. That's a long way to go. But, I mean, for but, you to take that bold step, I mean, that, it's a hard thing because we're trying to figure out how to implement that in our hospitals because people just don't understand. Mm -hmm. You know, they, it, it's a hard uh, process. It's a wisdom of the crowd. So the way it works is you got to get the whole tribe on board with the power of what it is and, and make them feel like they're part of the change, you know. So your state doesn't have the obesity rates as mine, but it's still out there. It's massive. So when people really, you know, they give a shit, right? I mean, you edit that out if you want. It's like, yeah, yeah. look, we, I work in healthcare and I need to, to give, right? Like, and if they know that a small part of, of them helping is let's not have sugar here, they can go home and get it, but, but exactly. there's, they feel good about it. So it's about the why, and that's why two years in, no one's asked for my head. They, yeah, they yeah. all have my email, they all have my phone number, it's posted in the call room, you know, they can reach me. Yeah, but, the, but you're seeing the nurses being, I mean, you know, yeah, you, you've the made a huge impact, the right? Yeah, the they're advocates because they, they've experienced it. My on that. dietitian was a lead in this, right? My di People here, it's like the dietitians are not the enemy to the low carb movement. You know, we need to, Yeah. the ones who like actually, and at the big dietitian meeting this year, you know, just like the AHA would be for the heart, ADA meeting for dietitians, not the Diabetes Association. They have a big national meeting. And, and my dietitian came back and said, gosh, the most attended talk that just developed the most mm. buzz was the talk on low carb. I've heard that same thing. I've heard that same thing at yeah. conferences where they, yeah, you know, yeah. really- They, they want to know about it, right? Yeah, and it's good because, you know, I think that's a, that's a problem is, People think we're at war with each other. No, you know, we no. want to help the patients, and so we're, we're just taught differently. And the problem is that that as low carb guys have is that you can't unsee what you've seen. Once you've seen yeah, it, and you, you see someone come up insulin, it. you've seen all this stuff. You think, wow, I can't go back to what I was doing before. Yeah, if someone has a glucose monitor on and a bagel rises them two hundred points, you know, because the bagels are this big now, they cannot unsee that. And what I will say on that too is, is for me. I don't like to argue with people. I like facts. Oh, no, I like data. data. So I have two diabetes educators that, I, that I'm their doctor, yeah. and they came to me and they said, this crazy keto stuff makes us nuts, or everyone's talking <laughs> about it. And I said, I'll tell you what, this is your career. Why don't we do this? And as a matter of fact, in, in, in Fat Fiction, the movie, they do it precisely this. And I had done it. I beat them to it, by the way. No, but mm -hmm. what I did is I said, here, put this on. Nice. Wear it for a week, and then, and then do your diet. So do low carb for a week, and do your diet exactly. for a week. And they both $60. texted me, emailed me, and said, Whoa. what do I do now? <laughs> what do I do you now? You just turn their world because upside it, down. Because it turns your world upside down when you realize, like, oh, oh, my sugar maintains by not putting, because I showed her my, when they came in, I showed them, here's my readings. Well, it's that spike from, I worked out hard that day, right? Yeah. Just like what we're talking about. Yeah, so when you start realizing that, that, you realize when you're fasting, you're not dropping your sugars to zero. Everyone kind of has that concern. Our no, body's no, fairly when smart, you're fasting, huh? It's actually like beautifully it's good. Flat. Yeah, it's and flat. it'll go up with times of stress, like fasted exercise, it'll go up, which is good. Then you feel good. Correct. The yeah, energy exactly is like right. going into the mitochondria. It's crazy. Yeah, it's coming out of, out of the storage places and going to where people you need think, it. And, you know, yeah. All these people are all crazy. They say they can like run, you know, 20 miles on no food and no, and they think you're well, like we have lying. Zach Bitter breaking all the records doing this kind it's of stuff. Real. And, yeah, so it's, when you start really understanding real. the physiology and how it works, it's remarkable. So, Mark, how do people get in touch with you? Yeah, so, um, I mean, you can contact me by email, afrundock at gmail.com. I have a website, Dr. Mark's Desk, which links out to a book I wrote called Run For Your Life. I have a little running shoe store that links there too and uh, the running races that we do in West Virginia. So we have a whole uh, nonprofit building trails in schools. So we host running races, you know, that are multiple times throughout the year that bring in money to do stuff in the community. So yeah, and uh, come, come, to, come visit West Virginia. Good place. Yeah, I'm coming out. But it's just, change if you're watching. It's just this, awesome make, what, make what he's change. doing. It's just super, super amazing. I, I mean, very. Tro and I were so impressed with what you're doing, what you're accomplishing, and such an honor to have you on the on the podcast and just to see you here and get to hang out well, with low you. Low carb bit New York. Come to low carb New York. Yeah, we'll see. Fun. It may be a virtual uh, New York. We'll see. I'm yeah, gonna call I know. Tro July. This we'll is just July, right? Oh, geez. Yeah. We'll yeah, see so what I happens. Hope this all passes. Yeah, over yeah, yeah. But anyways, thank you for listening. You got a special guy here, and and I hope you learned something.